Today on Inside the Issues, I speak with Mark Raymond on Internet Governance. Hello and welcome to this week's edition of Inside the Issues, the CG online podcast. I'm David Welch, CG Chair of Global Security at the Balsley School of International Affairs and Professor of Political Science at the University of Waterloo. Every week I'm happy to welcome into the studio here at the Center for International Governance Innovation an expert in some important area of international governance or international public policy. And today I'm happy to welcome back uh, Mark Raymond, the uh, CG Fellow in Global Security and uh, lead researcher on the Internet Governance Project with uh, CG Distinguished Fellow Gordon Smith. And uh, you're just back recently from an important uh, meeting in Ottawa uh, to help shape and formulate CG's um, new project on internet governance, which we'd like to talk about. So we'll start with that, a little bit of uh, background on what CG is trying to do, the purpose of the project, and then we'll go out from there to talk about uh, the issues, the substantive issues that you'll be addressing. Sure. Uh, the purpose of the project really at a basic level is to formulate a high-level strategic vision for what kind of an internet that Canada and countries like Canada should want to see by approximately 2020. So looking at sort of about a five to eight year range, a medium term vision for what the internet should look like and how it should work. And is the sense that it shouldn't look like what it is today? Or is it one of the options that it should continue to look like what it is today? The basic option is to, to continue to improve on the existing model. There's nothing fundamentally broken with it at least in uh, the view of most Western countries, but that view isn't shared globally. And there's a, a sort of brewing effort that's been going on for a few years and is coming to a head in the next year or two uh, to sort of fundamentally change the way the internet does work. Canada and countries like Canada have been a little bit slow in developing strategies and ideas about how they want to respond to these proposals from other countries. And we want to be able to provide good knowledge about how Canada should think about these issues and what kinds of uh, battles we should be fighting and how we should be uh, formulating our position in them. And people who think that the internet is is broken or is not functioning as well as it should would point to what kinds of issues in particular as the things that they'd like to try to fix? A number of them really. Everything from cyber terrorism, cyber crime, uh, to something as simple as spam email. So there are a number of different ways that you can say the internet is broken. The question is what what should be done about it? And there are a broad range of different views there with really massive implications for, uh, for the economy, for people's everyday lives and how they communicate, uh, including how they communicate about political issues and freedom mm -hmm. of speech issues. So there are some really big stakes here. So for those of us who use the internet, which is almost everyone, but don't necessarily understand much about how it's governed at the moment, can you walk us through the bits and pieces of internet governance as, as they are today? Uh, who, who governs it? How is it governed? Where are the centers of authority and power? How are decisions made about how the internet operates? Bits and pieces really is the right description because there's no uh, coherent, unified framework for how this is done. There are a number of different organizations and groups uh, that are involved with internet governance. Many of them have very voluntaristic roots. So for example, the Internet Eng Engineering Task Force, the IETF, is one of the key groups that develops technical standards for, uh, for the internet, which determines how uh, routers work and how uh, information is routed through the, the internet to get from your computer to the website you want to visit, which may be anywhere in the world, of course, or to send an email from your computer to a computer somewhere else in the world. So uh, the IETF is one group. The Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, ICANN, is another. It's a nonprofit organization incorporated in California. It has uh, a long and interesting history, originally uh, being a, a contractee of the United States government. Uh, and it runs what's called the domain name system, which is the uh, way that internet protocol addresses, so numbers, are translated into human uh, readable and rememberable website names. So for example, uh, www.cgonline.org is assigned a unique IP address and uh, when someone tries to look up the cgonline.org website, that website, the URL, has to be translated from a domain name into an IP address and ICANN runs that system. Uh, let's see, internet governance is also um, an area where state laws come into play. Domestic laws on privacy, domestic laws on intellectual property, domestic laws on uh, safety and law enforcement. All of these things impact internet governance even if they weren't designed with internet governance in mind. So 
if you want to think in broad terms, internet governance has happened kind of by accident. We didn't set out with any coherent vision or view of how the internet should be governed or would be governed when it was commercialized in the mid-1990s, but we've sort of evolved these rules and institutions over time, many of them very voluntaristic, many of them much less state-based than most international or global governance issues. States have less of a direct role here than they do in almost any other issue. Mm -hmm. The last piece of the puzzle is the private sector. Most internet infrastructure in most areas of the world is owned by private companies. These private companies play key governance roles. In fact, they are performing governance. They are making governance decisions in a broad range of, of issue areas. One of them involves something as simple as how traffic is exchanged across different networks. So if you're at home, you have an internet service provider, and when you make a website request, that internet service provider has to send that request to the destination. Chances are the destination isn't on the same internet service provider's network. That's especially true in Canada because most of what Canadians look at on the internet is not in Canada. That's true of a lot of countries. Uh, the, the content providing countries on the internet are very small in number. The United States plays a dominant role. Some large European countries play a dominant role. And increasingly countries like China host a lot of internet content as well. So, when you're looking at something on a different internet provider's network, that traffic has to be exchanged. Most internet traffic is still exchanged on the basis of what's called settlement-free peering. And this is just an informal, in many cases, a completely unwritten agreement between internet service providers that they will exchange traffic between their networks free of cost. So unlike telephones where you pay, you don't pay for exchange of traffic. The companies themselves don't pay each other for the exchange of internet traffic. But if those unwritten agreements were to break down at some point in the future, traffic suddenly wouldn't be exchanged and the internet would fragment. And all of a sudden, in the worst case scenario, all you could look at would be the websites and email addresses that were hosted on your own internet service provider, uh, which for most Canadians would be a rather disastrous outcome. All right, so internet governance sounds like a recipe for chaos. So far we've managed to avoid that. We'll be back in a minute to talk more with Mark Raymond. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So my experience of the internet is it actually seems to work pretty well. Uh, so I'll be interested to hear more about uh, those who think that it's broken and, and needs to be fixed. But before we talk about that and the th concrete things people or countries might like to do to change uh, internet governance, maybe we can talk a bit about the difference between and the relationship between internet governance and internet security. Those are not necessarily synonymous. They're not synonymous. Uh, but perhaps you can walk us through the basic distinction and then we'll drill down to a finer level if need be. Sure, so if we want to talk about internet governance, that really gets at a broad range of issues. Uh, they can sort of be divided into three baskets. So you can think, first of all, about internet governance in terms of intellectual property and the kinds of content you view and how you pay for it or if you pay for it and who you pay. So uh, artists, uh, motion picture companies, recording companies, uh, media outlets all have an interest in being paid for the content that they produce. It's how they make their living, it's how they make their profit in case of companies, and those companies are very concerned about the amount of piracy that goes on and about the really strikingly dominant expectation that content on the internet is free, or at the very least that all you have to do is put up with some nuisance advertisements kind of on the sides or top of the page, right? That's a dominant view. And there's even something called the Pirate Party in Europe that uh, is a, a political party that has members in, I believe, the Swedish Parliament and also the European Parliament uh, dedicated to the notion that Internet content should be free. Uh, there are groups like the Creative Commons movement uh, that also have somewhat similar views on, on at least curtailing intellectual property restrictions. So that's one basket of issues. The second basket of issues pertains to what we might call civil liberties, including privacy. So uh, here the issues are who stores your data? Uh, who can collect what data about you and what permission they need from you to do it. So when you sign up for Facebook and you skip through the end user licensing agreement, like everyone does, uh, what are you signing away? And how can those contracts be written? What can companies uh, 
get you to agree to in order to use their services? And how uh, do we govern and regulate that and make sure there aren't abuses, frankly, of that information? It's the second set of issues, although I, mean, I should note as well that in many parts of the world, including some advanced industrial countries, the, the threat to privacy and civil liberties is not only from private companies, it's very much from governments. Mm -hmm. Governments have uh, increasingly sophisticated capabilities to uh, monitor internet usage and determine uh, what websites people are visiting and even what they're saying online in chat rooms and in email. Mm -hmm. uh, General Petraeus found out uh, exactly how sophisticated some of those capabilities are. That's right. So that's the second basket of issues. The third issue uh, sort of area is internet security. So internet security is a subset of internet governance. And if we're looking at security, that really crosses a number of boundaries as well. I mean, on the one hand, there's domestic law enforcement uh, that has an interest in ensuring uh, that they can monitor bad guys, right? That they can find the guys in the black hats. Uh, both within their, their own states and across borders. On the second level, there's sort of the, the notion of protecting the physical layer of the internet. So when we talk about the internet, it's not only cyberspace, it's a physical layer of infrastructure that mainly consists of fiber optic cable and routers and servers. Those are the three basic components uh, to a first approximation of, of the physical layer of the internet. Those things can be very vulnerable. Uh, there was an incident a few years ago where a ship dropped anchor in the eastern Mediterranean just off the, the Lebanese coast, and the anchor severed two internet cables, undersea cables. A uh, reduction of all internet uh, bandwidth to Asia of about 70% persisted until those were fixed. So there are choke points on right. the, the global internet network. Uh, it's in some ways like sea lanes, right? There mm -hmm. are key strategic points. Uh, there are also things called internet exchange points, which are the physical server locations where different internet providers exchange traffic and perform that settlement free peering that we talked about a moment ago. So there are key strategic points that could be targets of attack. The internet is designed to be very resilient. It's designed to overcome failures. That was uh, part of its initial purpose and its initial uh, operational design, but there are limits to that. And uh, even if the internet can't totally be shut down in that way, in most places, some developing countries have tried to shut the internet down for political purposes, mainly to suppress dissent. And even in advanced industrial economies, uh, capabilities could be degraded. So the internet may become uh, very sluggish, very slow, very high latency uh, as a result of attacks, either uh, through software and code or physical attacks on key infrastructure points. So internet security really encompasses a number of different issue areas where states are only just becoming aware of the importance. And is the internet a battleground? Is it a, a scene of conflict? And if so, between which kinds of actors? The last year or two has really kind of seen some troubling signs in that regard. Stuxnet is the first uh, really high profile example of a, a cyber attack or a computer network attack in that case that damaged physical property. It damaged some centrifuges that were involved in the Iranian uh, efforts to enrich nuclear material. That is key because typically people had understood computer attacks mainly as things that would sort of shut down websites. They'd be like virtual sit-ins or what are called distributed denial of service attacks. That was sort of the popular understanding of what a computer attack, computer network attack meant. Stuxnet changes that because it shows that code has the possibility of damaging physical objects. And so that's a state-to-state -state interaction in which the internet is used as another field of battle. We think it was state-to-state. -state. We're not entirely sure who was responsible for Stuxnet, but the thinking is that it was so sophisticated that it almost had to be a state, mm -hmm. that private actors don't yet at least have that capability. The danger, of course, is that once that code is out there on the internet, then it is freely available and can be used. So these are weapons that get loose very easily. Right. They're very hard to control. Mm -hmm. And other actors that uh, use the internet for malevolent purposes include uh, criminal networks, I suppose, organized crime, yep. uh, terrorists. Much evidence of terrorists using the internet, or is that a ton of evidence? Of, hype? A ton of evidence of terrorist communication on the internet. Right. Not much evidence that terrorists have targeted the internet. Right. And in part, that may be because they rely on it. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, what law enforcement typically likes to do is surveil the use of the internet by those terrorist groups. Rather than shutting the websites down, they monitor them. 
And how big a problem is uh, commercial or industrial espionage or sort of white collar economic crime on the internet? The best understandings I've seen are that there is a lot of theft of intellectual property on the internet, but most of it is actually done by states, we think. Uh, the, the number of actual companies engaged in this kind of activity seem to be very low. Uh, there are networks, particularly coming out of China and Russia, that have been very active, and the suspicion is that these are state-backed, if not state-controlled. Mm -hmm. Very good. We'll be back again with Mark Raymond. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So Mark, I understand that uh, soon there'll be a series of important international meetings that will have implications for how the internet is governed and secured. So perhaps you could let us know uh, what's happening when and, and who will be there and what will they be doing? Sure. So uh, the first meeting coming up is in Dubai in December, uh, early December. It's the World Conference on International Telecommunications. And the purpose of the conference is to negotiate an update to a treaty called the International Telecommunication Regulations, the ITRs, which are administered by the International Telecommunications Union, the ITU, which is part of the UN system. Um, the ITU historically uh, first dealt with telegraphs, so it's actually a very old international organization. It was then uh, later updated as telecommunications advanced to deal with uh, radio, uh, telephone, uh, with um, cellular signals mm -hmm. now in mobile. Uh, actually predates the UN, doesn't it? Yes, the it ITU, does. Yeah. yeah, it's, I believe, the 1860s it mm -hmm. was created. Very old organization. Uh, in any event, the ITU is holding this conference that will bring together representatives from almost every state in the international system to negotiate new telecommunications rules. And telecommunications, of course, aren't exactly the same as the Internet, but there's a great deal of overlap. And this set of negotiations can have some clear impacts on Internet governance. In particular, there's a group of states, mainly led by Russia and China, but also including some Arab states and some other states, mainly from the developing world, uh, that have a coordinated, to some extent, agenda for what they want to see on Internet governance. And what they want is to move Internet governance from the current multi-stakeholder model, things like the IETF, ICANN, those kinds of uh, private and voluntaristic groups, they want to move it into the UN system, and they want to make the International Telecommunications Union also responsible for the Internet. That's their long-term end game. And for Western viewers, especially Canadians who are predisposed to think kindly of the UN, that may sound, on one level, like not a bad thing, right? That maybe this ought to be internationally governed. It's certainly internationally important. The problem is the kind of international governance that this group of countries wants to see would fundamentally change the way the Internet works and could constitute a major threat to the open, free, globally interoperable Internet that we know today. So it would be much more highly regulated Internet with more room for state oversight. Yes, and in particular for state surveillance. Uh, and there's already a great deal of troubling conduct here with dissidents and in a number of countries being explicitly targeted simply for their political beliefs and states are using these sophisticated surveillance capabilities that they're increasingly developing to do that. Uh, that could expand under this kind of a, a situation. The other major stake is that these countries want to change the economics of how the internet works. Uh, the, the current economics of the internet benefit Western countries because we were the originators and pioneers of this technology to a large extent. Uh, a lot of Western companies benefit and these uh, Non-Western countries are now trying to change that. They want a foothold in these industries. They see them as strategic industries for the future, and they are very highly motivated to get every advantage that they can. Mm -hmm. So there are clear economic stakes here as well. Uh, after Wicket, the next uh, conference is also run by the ITU. It's the World Technology Policy Forum, the WTPF. That one is going to be held in Geneva in May of next year, I believe. And it will take up a lot of the issues that are um, introduced at Wicket in Dubai. So this will be very much a continuation of that same agenda. And Canada and other Western countries really need to do more work in thinking about what kind of Internet we want to see so that we know what kinds of negotiating positions that we want to take. If you don't know what you want walking into a negotiation, it's a fundamental disadvantage. That's the position we're in now to a large extent. Uh, the Canadian government and others like it are starting to get coordinated and get engaged on these issues, but uh, they're playing catch up, and we need to, to help, them, help them do that in order that we actually see 
a continued free and open internet. Mm. So just to play devil's advocate for a minute, some people might be tempted to say that this can't make too much of a difference because under the existing um, order, states already have legal authority over whatever happens on their own territory in respect of internet traffic. In other words, those states, if they wish, uh, can survey. They can um, ask courts to summon records of, you know, um, websites people visit in the course of a criminal prosecution. Even if necessary, they can require that um, keys be handed over to unlock secure communication. So some people might say states can already do all that under the existing governance arrangement. How, how different would it be, how, how much worse would it be uh, if the UN handled this rather than um, the multi-stakeholder governance model? Right, so a lot of this relates to which state can do this to you. Right. So if you're a Canadian citizen, it's unquestionable that the Canadian government's laws apply to you and that the Canadian government has certain powers to uh, engage in search and in uh, different kinds of monitoring behavior in the, the course of criminal prosecutions and ensuring public safety. However, the economic agenda that Russia, China, and the Arab states are pursuing is in part about determining how and where internet traffic is routed. So for instance, if you as a Canadian look up a website, if uh, the data packets transit through other countries, that's actually very common. And the current internet routing protocols are designed to route traffic in the most efficient, fastest way with complete disregard for national borders. So they will send you bouncing through a number of different countries to get to your ultimate destination depending on where the network has capability at that time. There is no advanced determination of where that traffic goes, which means you as a user have no idea which countries your data packets will bounce through. The problem is, of course, that the agenda that these states are pursuing could lead to situations increasingly where traffic is routed through their borders. And what that means then is those data packets are subject to their domestic laws. So as a Canadian, your data would be subject not only to American law, which it currently often is now already, but also potentially to Russian law and Chinese law. That, I think most Canadians would agree, is a cause for concern, that there are clear uh, worries about intellectual property and civil rights and freedoms and privacy that come from that. And that, that degree of monitoring, if it's decoupled from political representation especially, is very problematic. We should at least have democratic re uh, recourse to the governments that have control over our data. Mm -hmm. Very good. We'll be back one last time with Mark Raymond. You're watching or listening to Inside the Issues, a CG Online podcast. Look for us at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube. Welcome back. So, Mark, in our last few minutes, let's uh, talk about what's at stake. You, you've said already that Canada doesn't seem to have a policy on the kind of uh, internet it would like to see. Um, maybe that means Canada is satisfied with the essential architecture at the moment and happy with the current uh, governance arrangement. Uh, but if, if this battle plays out in different possible ways, how would the internet be different for you and me as end users and for states and corporations? Uh, would, we, would it fundamentally change how we run our lives? So there are basically three different models that we can think about that would be very different from what we see today. Uh, the first one to extend what we were just talking about would be a very state uh, controlled model where there's a lot of surveillance and where the kinds of websites you're visiting and what you're saying uh, to friends, family members and other acquaintances by email is really very easily susceptible to state surveillance and control and where even um, communications could be blocked or altered. Uh, by state security apparatuses that want to maintain uh, very tight control. And these governments want to do this because they think it will help them to stay in power. They think it will help them to uh, be able to pursue repressive policies that in many cases personally enrich them and their families at the expense of their populations. There are clear human rights impacts there. And that's the first model. The second model is a fragmented internet where cyber attacks become much more common, different groups of countries build firewalls, uh, where economic models are contentious rather than cooperative as they are now and it, where there are fees and charges for internet traffic crossing borders, what you would see then is almost like regional blocks. So we would have multiple internets, 
that would be an internet for Western countries, an internet for uh, potentially Asian countries, uh, and so on and so forth. And this diminishes the global reach of the internet, which diminishes its cultural diversity. It also diminishes the economic potential of the internet. Uh, even if there were very limited gateways between these different internets, there would be huge economic losses over time. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to calculate those, of course, because we don't know what would happen uh, counterfactually, but the best estimates are that those costs over the long term would be highly significant in terms of foregone economic productivity and uh, thus income mm -hmm. for people. So that's the second model. The third model is one where civil society actors become highly motivated and continue to resist state control. This kind of an internet would see not only state-to-state -state cyber attacks, but would see increased civil disobedience on the internet. And some of it, that can be highly disruptive. So you would see hacker groups continuing to launch uh, denial of service attacks, continuing to engage in some cases in identity theft. You would see obviously a lot of cyber criminality as well. The internet would then become a dangerous place, uh, even more so than it can be today and people would have a lot to lose by going online. That may create chilling effects, and it may, again, cause a lot of economic damage. It may cause a lot of damage to people's privacy and to their identities. Um, so that kind of an outcome could result, too, if a lot of people perceive Internet governance to be state-run and thus illegitimate, and then continue to resist that model. So if we see movement to a state model, there's possible uh, backlash that may occur. Now, the status quo as we know it today sounds more like the third model than the first and second, closest to the third. Is it the best of all possible worlds? Is it what we should be defending in Canada? It's clear that the current model can be improved. Developing countries in particular have reasonable concerns about uh, the lack of emphasis on their issues and on their priorities for the Internet. Uh, what would some examples of those be? The domain name system is, to date, almost entirely in Latin characters. And obviously there are languages on the planet that don't use Latin characters. This is an area where ICANN and the current multi-stakeholder model have actually been moving toward a solution. They are currently uh, in the, the final phases of pre-implementation for what are called internationalized domain names, or IDNs. And these would be website uh, domain names that would be in non-Latin scripts. So for instance, in Cyrillic, in uh, Chinese, uh, in Arabic, those would be the big three in terms of global demand for those kinds of domain names. Uh, so people in those languages would be able to use the internet in their own alphabets. And but people who didn't have a Cyrillic keyboard in Canada wouldn't be able to access certain websites who would, that have Cyrillic uh, That's domain true, names. although there could be mirroring sites set up. So if you entered a Latin uh, character URL, you would get the same website, right? Mm -hmm. So there are uh, plentiful opportunities to create interoperability between those, those different character sets. Um, but the key point is that moving to these internationalized domain names is a way that we can make the internet more inclusive and more open to people who don't speak a Latin character language. Mm -hmm. And these are areas where we are making progress, but it's certainly not the only issue. There are key capacity issues in developing countries in terms of uh, access to enough broadband, uh, band bandwidth and optical cable. There are human resource deficits in terms of capacity in network engineering and software engineering. Uh, software engineering. Um, developing countries have been underrepresented in creating the standards, the technical standards for the internet. That is again slowly changing, but this is an area of concern. So there are a lot of development related issues in internet governance as well that deserve more consideration than they have been given. And are the cyber libertarians that you were alluding to earlier absent from the scene when it comes to the upcoming set of negotiations about internet governance? We don't exactly know, of course, because it's difficult to monitor these groups. But to the extent that we can make guesses about their reactions to past events like this, it's highly likely there will be some form of public response, uh, whether that takes the form of YouTube videos, whether it takes the form of tweets. Uh, or potentially more disruptive things like denial of service attacks. It's not clear yet. Hopefully that will be minimized. I think there are more constructive ways for those kinds of voices to participate in this dialogue. But again, that's an area where internet governance can improve too. It needs to be participatory and it needs to include people who feel very passionately about the internet and believe in it as a cause and are highly motivated to, to mm. act on that basis. And how would CG like to contribute to this 
debate. In part by informing public dialogue, just like we're trying to do today, uh, in part by formulating a strategy report that will be uh, hopefully helpful not only to the Canadian government but to other like-minded governments that believe in the multi-stakeholder model uh, and can in inform them in developing a position for what kind of internet they want to see so that when they enter these negotiations with countries that want more state control that our negotiators have a clear sense of how they prioritize different issues uh, especially where there are trade-offs and tensions between them uh, but also how they can articulate a positive vision for the internet rather than simply saying no because in international negotiations if you're simply always in the position of saying no you tend to sort of get whittled away at over time and you tend to lose mm. uh, and if we can articulate a positive vision there's more of a chance that we will actually get the internet that we want even if it looks very much like the one we have today well very good well we all have an interest in seeing how this unfolds so thank you for coming in and helping us understand it better and to the audience, thank you for joining us once again on Inside the Issues, the CG Online podcast. A look for us again next week at cgonline.org, on Facebook, on Twitter, and on YouTube.